Data leak has revealed detailed policies uh, followed by China's detention camps for Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang province. The International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, or the ICIJ, has accessed highly confidential government documents from 2017, which show how inmates are locked up and punished. One of them is a nine-page memo that was sent out by the then Deputy Secretary of the Communist Party. It includes guidelines for running the camps and a security protocol. The ICIJ has labeled the documents as the, as the China cables. The memos show that every aspect of the detainee is monitored and controlled. And here's what it actually says. Well, there must be a, a video surveillance, security equipment and one button alarms at each zone. The security personnel have to strictly control all student activities in order to prevent escapes, bath time, eating period, toilet break, family visit every little thing. The police has to ensure perfect peripheral isolation, inter internal separation. They are expected to punish the detainees for behavioral violations. There are three different management areas, very strict, strict and general. The training method depends on the level of strictness. Uh, the students are asked to obey management and truly transform. The top priority is remedial Mandarin studies. All lessons are in Mandarin and the students have to eventually adapt the language into their daily lives. The memo further says uh, that de-extremification has to be integrated while teaching China's national language. The work policy of the camp is strong and highly sensitive and the staff is expected to maintain top secrecy. The camp monitors students' lives for at least a year after they leave the camp. Each aspect of the memo undermines what Beijing has been claiming for the past three years. What really stood out from the document is that right away the number one priority is to prevent those quote-unquote students from escaping. It gives detailed instructions about how to lock doors, lock doors right after students have gone through, about police guards, about patrols, about surveillance systems that leave no blind spots. How has China reacted to the leaked memo? The Chinese embassy in the United Kingdom has said that the leaked documents are pure fabrication and fake news. There is no such thing as detention camps. So vocational training centers have been set up for the prevention of terrorism. The statement said, and I quote here, the preventive measures have nothing to do with the eradication of religious groups. Religious freedom is fully expected in Xinjiang. The embassy also said that Mandarin was just taught as one of the courses at the centers. It also said that the personal freedom of the trainees is fully guaranteed. Now, Beijing's claims are contradictory to the personal accounts of former detainees and camp instructors. Listen in. Mm-hmm.所有的人是都是无辜的人，没有什么罪，没有什么呃犯罪的或者说未犯的，没有这样子情况。但是你他们就是被他们强迫性的情况下，你必须给自己。Mm-hmm. And all the rest of the list, uh, both the Dindin Zahalandala, both Slam Dinidian, but Jukum Nakisel, both Chetalad and Ikkergen, Amelia Tepo, Jungoda, Perdin, Yeni, Buddha de Rebotskerek, Onodan Baska, Mandak Baska de Lara, Shengelik. Another document revealed that the Chinese government has been using technology to target Uyghurs. China has a surveillance racknet called uh, Integrated Joint Operations Platform, which gathers a detailed database of everything about an individual. The documents reveal that in a single week in June 2017, the, uh, uh, this happened and the IOGA flagged more than 24,000 individuals in parts of Xinjiang alone. Out of these, 15,000 were sent to detention camps and more than 700 were jailed. The system flagged 1.8 million people simply because they had data sharing app called Zapia on their phones. Uh, the China cables also include the judgment from a court in Xinjiang. A Muslim man was sentenced to 10 years in prison for advocating Islamic religious practices. He also uh, he was punished for... Uh, for telling his co-workers not to use profanity or watch pornography.
All right, to talk a little bit more about the China cables, we are now joined by the ICIJ project manager, Fergus Scheel. And Fergus Scheel, thanks very much for talking to us. How is China, the China cables, different from other exposures, including uh, the latest by the NYT? What differentiates China cables from previous investigations are two things, primarily. The first is that it's the first time ever that there's an operation manual has been revealed for the camps in which more than a million uh, Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities are understood to have been detained. That's the first thing that makes a difference from all other uh, reports on it. There have been anecdotal reports, there have been satellite images, and of course, most, most recently, there was the New York Times report, which we looked at the sort of policy settings for these camps. But this is the very first time that a document outlining the operation of the camps has been leaked. And we understand that it's the first document of its kind to have come out of China for more than 30 years because of its classification, classification level. The second thing that we can say about it is that it's the first time ever that the um, surveillance platform, uh, uh, the surveillance platform data sweep has been revealed in such detail. So what we have is we have one um, telegram, which is effectively an operation manual for the camps in which more than a million Uyghurs are believed to be detained. And secondly, we have four bulletins or directives from the chief security person in Xinjiang outlining the kind of data which is used to uh, uh, as, as the basis for detaining people without charge, without judicial pr process. Um, so, and the simplest thing can have you detained. So in one week alone in, 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 in 2017, something like 15,000 people were detained according to the bulletins. And many of those people were detained simply for having an app on their phone or for having sought a visa to leave the country or for having returned to the country on the mere suspicion of, of, of behavior that um, the government considers um, unacceptable. Right. And uh, Mr. Sheila, enough has been said about, of course, uh, this coming right from the top. Is there evidence then that can link all of this directly to President Xi? So what we know about Xi Jinping's involvement in, in the, uh, what has occurred in Xinjiang, in the, in the mass detention of Uyghurs, in the mass detention of an uh, uh, of, of ethnic minority that is primarily Muslim, is that Xi Jinping authorized it in speeches um, and in directions after some, uh, uh, some horrific, but um, you know, nevertheless, uh, uh, some, some horrific terror attacks in Xinjiang, which um, the response uh, from the Chinese authorities was uh, has been extraordinarily um, sweeping. So there were some awful terror attacks in which uh, many people were injured and, and died. And in response to that, the uh, the Xinjiang authorities, with the uh, approval of and and the, and and the encouragement of Beijing. Uh, have detained more than a million people. And to give you an idea of the scope of that, in Xinjiang there are about 11 million Uyghurs. So basically every family in Xinjiang has had somebody who has been more or less disappeared. They've disappeared into camps, some for months, some for more than a year. And in the camps, when they when they when when they when they get into the camps, they are uh, the, the 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 documents that we have revealed show that they are forced to learn Mandarin, they are forced to learn uh, Chinese law, we're not quite sure what that means. So they are, it's, it is essentially the targeting of, a, of an ethnic religious minority in order to socially re-engineer them. And China says that the reason for this is to prevent terrorism, and the reason for this is to re-educate a impoverished, impoverished community. But what our documents show is that people who are never suspected of terrorism could never be suspected of terrorism because there are so many. There are so many people that have never committed a crime. More than a million people who have never committed a crime have been detained regardless. And once they are in the camps, the regimen that they, are, they, are, uh, they suffer under is really rigorous. The camps are guarded by police stations, the car camps are guarded by towers, the camps are guarded by cameras, 
the, uh, pe- the detainees uh, must uh, use the same seat every day, must line up in the same way every day. Right, that seems like some severe profiling there. But what is the evidence then against the role of Chinese embassies in tracking Uyghurs? So Chinese embassies abroad, all we can tell you is that, it, that Uyghurs that we have spoken with abroad in Ireland and in, in Turkey, and we've spoken to Uyghurs in Sweden, we've spoken to them in Netherlands, uh, Germany, Canada, and all of, what they all say is that they are worried uh, by the behavior of not simply, not, not simply the, what is happening to their friends and relatives back in Xinjiang, but also how their local embassies monitor them. And that's as much as I can say about it, that they, they, they are frightened that the uh, local Chinese communities, in their community, wherever it is, whether it's Melbourne or whether it's, it's uh, Berlin or whether it's Dublin or Toronto, they worry that their local Chinese embassy um, is monitoring them. Right, and uh, given that, what is the number of non-Chinese or foreign citizens who could be in these prisons as well? Are there people from other countries? Yes, we, we think so. Um, in fact, we think that there are something like, um, uh, I think the figure I saw was something like 48, 48 something like 48 Australian Uyghurs in the detention camps. And, and, and you know, it, 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 it makes sense because when you, uh, when you read the documents, you see that one of the groups that are most under suspicion are, is, is anyone who has a, a visa or a passport for another country. So it, it just makes sense. But um, there, so there are, def, there are undoubtedly uh, dual nationalists, dual, uh, people with dual citizenship in the camps. How, how many, I don't know. Um, and uh, this is one of the things, one of the things is that, that nobody quite knows how many are in the camps. What we do know is that, that uh, hum, human rights groups and uh, overseas governments have said that it is, it is uh, uh, more than a million, but some people estimated that it could be, um, you know, more than two million. So, I mean, to, to, to give you an example in India, I mean, more than a million people will be, so, you know, a city the size of Varanasi, which I've been to, or, you know, so it's, it's, you know, that's, this is what you're, you're talking about. It's, you're not talking about, uh, it, it's quite, it's, it's almost unprecedented. You have to go back really to World War II to see anything like it. You know, to see uh, it's an entire, uh, you know, one-tenth of a community more or less vanish into detention camps. Well, certainly some very worrying trends there. And Fergus Shield, thanks very much indeed for joining us, sharing all that information that has come out in the latest investigative piece called The China Cables.